Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the PMA CIBC Summit Series. Before we get started with our program, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishna, Anishnabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse nations, Inuit and Métis. We acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and by doing so, give our respect to its first inhabitants. Because our audience is national, if you are joining us from outside the Toronto area, I encourage you to learn more about the traditional territories where you live, learn and work. So welcome. My name is Chris Markovic and, behalf of, and on behalf of PMA Breath or Realty Group, CIBC, our title sponsor, and our media partner, McHewitt, we're thrilled to have you all join us. Now I'm pleased to introduce Andy Brether, who will bring us up to speed with a quick market commentary and his remarks. Andy? Thanks, Chris, very much. Uh, great to be with you all this morning. Um, this is a tremendous subject today, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, it's bold, it's provocative, it's informative. I'm thrilled that we've taken this on. I congratulate all the panelists for participating in this very needed uh, discussion today. Let's talk about Q1 real estate here in Toronto. I, I have two words for it, wow and watch out. Uh, wow, because as you know it and feel it and are participating in it, prices have continued to soar. Q1 over last year up 21%, much higher in uh, detached product and just marginally up in condo, but a tremendous uh, uh, recovery underway in condo as the underlying price of townhouses and, uh, and uh, what I'll call low rise or ground oriented housing has soared. The, the condo market had kind of been hit hardest by COVID through last fall and began a recovery in January that continues really strongly into March. And you, you saw sales uh, on MLS increasing by 80% uh, month over month uh, in this past uh, March. Uh, what we're gonna feel going forward in April is a little pushback, some self-regulating going on. This is a good sign. This is a sign that the consumer's kind of going, whoa, too much price, too much pressure. So watch out, we're gonna see a little fence sense of pushback. My friends in the resale market tell me that multiple offers are kind of off the shelf at the moment, little pullback here. This is a good thing. You'll also have a sense of OSFI uh, the regulator of our federal banking system, who uh, June 1 will introduce uh, more stringent, tougher rules, our mortgage approvals to 5.25% is that base. Uh, details are available at BUILD or, or on PMA website. What, what, what will happen again is perhaps some uh, bit of signal on a pushback in, in market as we go forward. This is healthy. This is important. Uh, we could not sustain the kind of price evolution that we were involved in, leading to issues of, of some talk of you know, irrational exuberance and others. So expect April numbers to come out a little lower. March was world record, 15,000 sales in MLS. That's double the normal level. Uh, but we'll expect this COVID period has had a more immediate impact. Uh, this third wave, unlike the earlier waves that we had, uh, instilled greater fear. Fear leads to uncertainty, uncertainty causes inaction. So I'm suspecting that April's gonna be a little softer because of that. And we'll just have to watch where that begins to unfold. Uh, an election, federal election is on the horizon. I had suspected it might be June, could get pushed back. It may depend on some of the elements occurring in the marketplace and then watch for the impact of uh, the cancellation of line five, the uh, natural gas and, and oil line through Michigan to Sarnia, which uh, the government of Michigan has canceled and is uh, shutting down on May the 15th. There hasn't been much discussion about this. Uh, please pay attention to it. It could be very serious. It's 50% of our oil and propane and natural gas and jet fuel supply in totality. So it's a huge impact if this actually happens. Uh, the market's going to continue in a reasonably strong fashion, a little weaker demand side, but a continuing tight, tight supply. So you've got a market that's uh, poised to continue along this path of uh, really strong uh, activity. Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion, what a subject. Uh, 
uh, it's uh, Toronto, as you know, we live and work here in this incredible city and in this incredible area. It's a, it's a breathing microcosm of diversity. Now, 54% of the people that live here were born somewhere else. Uh, the immigration flows over the last 10 years have been remarkable and 25 to 30% of it ends up here in Toronto. Uh, Canadians have always prided themselves, particularly on our traditions of tolerance and humility. And I think some of those areas have been a little strained in the last few years and certainly been feeling it. Uh, let me leave you with the words of, before I turn over to Ginny Shim, the words of my wonderful uncle Walter who lived a grand old age of 92. And um, I asked him uh, one Christmas dinner, I said, Uncle Walt, uh, you've traveled the world, you've, you've lived generations, you've been through two wars, world wars. Uh, what, what's your advice? What, what advice would you give me? What would you say to me the world needs more of? And, and he had two expressions. He said, the world needs more courtesy, courtesy for one another. I thought that was enormously insightful, a lesson that I've held close to my heart. And the world needs to learn to walk in someone else's shoes. And I thought that was also an amazing lesson of an understanding of how uh, sometimes we impose a, a moral equivalence that's completely unfair or unfounded because we haven't really recognized that we can walk in someone else's shoes. So here we are, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I'm gonna turn it over to the fabulous Ginny Shim now joining PMA and the a new venture called PMA 360. And um, uh, Jenny, well known within the Toronto market area, really, really uh, great analyst, uh, strong on the re research side of real estate and really understanding some of the movers and shakers of this world. Uh, Jenny, over to you. Thank great. you so much. Thank you, Andy, and welcome to everyone participating in our webinar today. My name is Jeannie Shim, and I'm honored to be your moderator for this really important discussion. Diversity, equity, and inclusion in real estate. Are we there yet? As we know, and as Andy mentioned, uh, Toronto is recognized as one of the most diverse cities and regions in the world. But those who are planning, designing, and making decisions about how our region and how our city grows does not necessarily reflect the same diversity of culture thought and lived experiences. Yet this diversity we know is our future and is the key to unlocking our untapped potential and our competitive edge as a city, region, and as a country. So really we've gathered here to kind of, you know, start discussing what can each of us do as individuals, as managers, as employers to recognize and embrace this diversity in order to ensure a better future uh, for our children. So to help us unpack and explore and address these, uh, these audacious questions today, we are joined by four accomplished guests from all walks of life and from a variety of professions, but all involved in city building in one way or, the, uh, or another. We have Brent Chamberlain, he's the AVP of Inclusion and Diversity at CIBC, and he's joining us to share his thoughts on talent and workforce transformation in the financial sector. We have Arlene Didier, she's the Director of Private Sector and executive champion of diversity and inclusion at Collier's Project Leaders. And she's joining us to share her insights from 25 plus years of working in architectural design, construction and commercial real estate. Arlene was also awarded the Catalyst Canada Honors 2020 Business Leader Award, which recognizes role models of workplace in, in, for workplace inclusion. We also have Andrew Garrett with us. Andrew is Senior Principal of Real Estate at the Investment Management Corporation of Ontario. And he's joining us to share his insights from 20 plus years of working in real estate development, investment and asset management. And we also have Norm Lee with us. Norm Lee is the founder of Norm Lee Studios, Canada's leading architectural visual content studio. And he's joining us to share his unique insights from collaborating with a wide range of developers in the Toronto GTA and across the country. Uh, detailed bios are available in the original eblast and will be available on our website uh, together with, the, with this recording following the session and finally some quick housekeeping notes before we get started we're going to have a discussion for about 35 minutes with our panelists followed with uh, 10 minutes of q a and then uh, so if you do have any questions please don't hesitate to post the, to post them in the uh, q a uh, in our webinar so uh, let's get started 
So one of the biggest challenges when it comes to understanding this huge issue of diversity, equity, and inclusion is that each of us comes to the table only knowing what we know, right? Based on our own lived experiences, which is largely informed by where we come from, what neighborhood we grew up in, our culture, our socioeconomic status, our, our personal and professional networks, where we went to school, and so on. So our goal today is for you to hear the stories of successful colleagues in our industry who may have come from a different lived experience than yours, so that we can all know a little bit more at the end of this webinar than we did at the start. And in our pre-panel meeting, I should warn you that we explain to all of our panelists that this is meant to be a no-holds-barred discussion about how our industry is doing when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we've encouraged all of our panelists to speak uh, frankly, to speak as openly as they wish, um, uh, on their professional and personal experiences and thoughts. So I know you're in for a great discussion today uh, with a lot of passion, maybe some arm waving and uh, maybe a challenge or two thrown in as well. So let's get started. So to kick us off, I would like to ask each of our panelists to answer this question with a quick one-ish word answer of yes, no, hell no, maybe, not fast enough, stop ticking the boxes or whatever words of your choice. And the question is diversity, equity and inclusion in real estate. Are we there yet? Brent, do you want to kick us off? Uh, yeah, so I'll start by saying stop ticking the boxes. Okay, Arlene? Uh, not fast enough. Andrew? I'll say one third progress. And Norm? Uh, IG posts don't equate to diversity. Okay. So though you got the quick answers from all of our panelists. Thank you for coming. No, I'm just kidding. Let's <laughs> dig into, uh, if each of you can now please explain, I guess the main reason or motivator for how you answered the way you did. Brent, I'll start with you. Sure. Yeah, so I, I think when I think about the question, are we there yet? Uh, it, it frames the work around inclusion like a, um, like kind of like a race, right? With a finish line. And I think it's, it's important that we take some time to think about the fact that there is no finish line in this work, right? It, there are milestones along the way. And I think about things like, how we've succeeded or are trying to um, create more gender balanced leadership in our companies, right? That's a milestone along the journey, but this is you know, really something that I would encourage people to think of more like a lens uh, that we view the world through. So whether we're thinking about a hiring decision uh, or the design of a new product, it could be a credit card, it could be a building, have we thought about how inclusive design needs to be part of that? so that we can create an equitable future that truly works for everyone. Um, and I think once we get on that track, uh, we'll be in a much better place to really um, you know, move this journey ahead together uh, and, and stop thinking about it um, where we've got a number of boxes that we have to tick along the way. Thank you, Brent. Arlene, you said not fast enough. So um, I'll use women in construction and real estate to explain my reasonings because um, it's a clear example and it's what I know to be true. And so if we just look at, you know, Stats Can 2018, there's 37 million plus people in Canada. And of those, 61% are women working today. And in the world of construction and real estate, that means that there's 12.1%. That's the number of women that are working in real estate and construction. 7.9% of those are white women, right? And then we say, 1.7 are Latinx, 0.7 are Asian, and less than half of a percent are Black. And my First Nation sisters are too few to count. So these numbers represent a difficult truth, and there's been little to no change over the last 25 years. So of the 1.5 million people working in construction and real estate, less than 200,000 are women. And in real terms, what that means is for every 100 men on a construction site, there may be four women. So the fact that I've got staff that are women where there's no bathroom accommodations on a site, that's a real, that's a real project. So I think that I, I truly believe that there's much more work to be done um, and that we have to um, uh, really look at providing examples of people um, of diverse backgrounds because people can't be what they cannot see. And it's our responsibility to help people prosper and be successful. 
Thank you, Arlene. That's quite a uh, shocking statistic, but uh, not surprising as well, unfortunately. Andrew, uh, what are your thoughts? You said you think you're about a th we're about a third of the way there. Right. Uh, I would say a third, mainly just in terms of the, th the three items you mentioned. I, the one we're making progress is on is diversity. So, you know, as, as a country, you know, we've convinced multiple generations of international talent to come and make Canada their home. So the big five markets, and as Andrew pointed out before, you know, we, we have over 300,000 immigrants feeding our, our hospitals, our universities, our finance sectors, our real estate industry annually. So that's kind of been the gift that keeps on giving and we continue to see progress there. Although in, in some industries, we miss the opportunity to, to support those immigrants when they get here. So on the equity piece, uh, I think that's where we, we sh we've shown a lack of progress. Um, and, and many city builders, uh, you know, I, I would say are challenged to, to point to examples where they've really helped build up and, and support racialized neighborhoods. You know, um, those neighborhoods tend to be the ones that get kind of get gentrified or erased. And I'm not suggesting that it's always intentional, but it's, it's systemic in terms of it, it tends to be the path of least resistance. Um, uh, in, in, in city building and development. Uh, and I think following on, um, on Arlene's uh, point as well, um, the inclusion piece is missing quite a lot in, in commercial real estate, I find. Uh, you know, er, er, there's a, I would say sometimes a, a hostile work environment um, towards, towards women uh, in, in, in the industry. And, you know, I've, I've had the chance to be mentored by some uh, women commercial real estate executives. And I was always kind of surprised at um, how, I wouldn't say, I think microaggressions is always the wrong word, you know, how often in, in team meetings and, and various environments and you could constantly, could be constantly patronized or excluded. Uh, so I think, you know, there's still a significant amount of progress that needs to be made in the equity and inclusion pieces. Thank you, Andrew. And Norm, you said that, uh, I guess, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion is not, uh, you know, in, I guess, Instagram posts. Yeah, so like I, I, I know that all the organizations and, and leaders uh, understand and, and know the value of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, I just don't see them doing enough active step, taking enough active steps to make that happen. I think a lot of it's just a lot of PR and, you know, feel good stuff. And, you know, I don't see it, you know, where the rubber hits the road, you know, like I, I think about, you know, industry organizations like Build or I think about ULI and, you know, I'm a member of ULI and, and, you know, my biggest bone to pick with them is that, you know, they talk a good game about inclusion, but then when you look at the leadership and you go to an event, let's say, right. And I've talked about this ad nauseum. It's always the young sort of, colored kids that line up to sort of kowtow to the chieftains, right? Whereas I think if it was an active act of inclusion, diversity and, and inclusion, you know, the leaders are, should be the ones reaching out to those people versus the other way around. And I think th th there needs to be a moment where leaders realize it's their job to actively reach out and invite people in versus waiting for people to approach them. An excellent point, Norm, and uh, I certainly agree. Um, that's wonderful. Thank you for kicking us off with uh, kind of your quick high level thoughts. And uh, I guess we'll uh, speak to each of you kind of individually a bit more from your industry perspective. So, Andrew, we'll start with you based on your, I guess, 20 years uh, plus of working on the developer side of the industry. I know you touched on this a little bit, but if you can get into a bit more detail on how you feel the development industry is doing and embracing a diversity, uh, what are they doing well, not doing so well, maybe what more? Do you think maybe some specific ideas what can and should be done based on your experience, what you've seen in, the, in your uh, many years in the industry? Right. I was saying the in in sometimes um, we'll see uh, in city building projects, uh, you know that initial initial con conceptualization stage. Uh, there's a a very I'd say kind of vocal minority that's really in, Involved and embedded in that piece, whether it's in planning, town halls, um, uh, planning, uh, or, or you know, condo boards, all sorts of things. 
And so I think even from that initial seed of those developments, um, quite often there's not a, there's a lack of inclusion, and then that just tends to to follow through to the the uh, ultimate outcome when things are built and open. Um, it just reflects a lot of the desires and wants uh, sometimes of that, that that vocal minority. So what uh, I look for and, and hope to see more as uh, momentum behind is is that reaching out, you know, as Norman was saying, reaching out to that, I, I think, a less um, visible or marginalized um, minority, but uh, people that are going to enjoy and occupy these spaces. And it's really important. Um, I guess one of the examples I, I think of is, you know, there's a, there's a lot of challenges in Toronto about, you know, even naming an area in rural Jamaica, even though it had for a long time had so many small businesses and been known locally in that area, uh, it, was, it was a very big challenge um, getting that recognized and, and, and seeing support uh, and making sure that it was built gentrified. Um, I would say uh, another alternate example of where I did see it, more engagement from the developer um, itself was in kind of the Regent Park development and uh, over, you know, over a long period of time there were a lot of programs that I saw that, you know, nothing's perfect, but I, I saw efforts to engage the community uh, in terms of work opportunities, in terms of artistic uh, uh, expression. Uh, and so I think, you know, it really, really, there are a few examples, but there are some examples out there where people can start to draw and see how they can better be inclusive in their so it sounds like yeah from your experience really the, the leadership is important norm you touched on this as well right there's a there's a responsibility among the leadership to be an active part of the solution and reaching out and actively you know i guess seeing like who's not at the table you know who should we be uh, including and inviting arlene same question to you I come from a, your perspective in the construction and commercial real estate side uh you know what's uh, what have you seen the good the bad and the ugly uh, perhaps a way forward? So um, I believe we're evolving. Um, I was just doing a podcast with a, a senior vice president, a male colleague of mine in brokerage, and um, about what change he's seen in the industry over the last 28 years. And, and you know, we've been working together for 11 years. And he said something that I thought was um, a tipping point culturally, that uh, we've moved away from an industry that um, only used to select people by finding a good cultural fit. And now they talk about a cultural ad and the power of a cultural ad. I mean, I'm an anomaly in the environment that, that I work in, um, uh, and which is disappointing. Um, because I think we'd be even more successful if there were more opportunities there. Um, so there's good coming from a bad sort of history and perspective of the cultural fit versus the cultural ad. My, my industry is involved tremendously in that um, we no longer define diversity as just women. Real estate industries to do that, they'd just be like, it's women. Um, and now we're looking at the diaspora that is Canada, ethnically, gender, socioeconomic, and the multiple dimensions that reflect the people uh, and our clients. So both internally, our talent, uh, and those that we represent. I think the challenge is overcoming unconscious bias when people don't realize that they're biased, right? And um, I think uh, we have to be intentional in changing our industry in all aspects from the top down and from the bottom up. So who we hire, who we promote, who leads us into the future to Norm's point, uh, you know, and, you know, in terms of how we would be looking forward. I know that at Collier's, like our journey really started in earnest intentionally laying out a plan in 2015 that was focused more around the women. But um, now uh, we've evolved to create uh, a mandate uh, and set up pillars around an inclusive workplace, 
employee resource groups. One of the biggest things is measuring and benchmarking and setting real goals. That's a huge challenge for those that are uh, within the industry because you have to voluntarily self-identify um, and, uh, and you have to have you know, faith in the confidentiality when you self-identify, they're gonna do something good with the information. And I think generally um, communicate to the industry as a whole through thought leadership and then really training our professionals and leading groups. Like we just had one um, a couple of weeks ago and it was really interesting um, to set up a safe environment for leaders to learn about and speak to unconscious bias and diversity and inclusion. I think, so there's good coming from, you know, a really systemically closed uh, culture in the past. Well, that's great insights. You know, as a, as we you know as we know you know we only know what we know, but that's not an excuse that you can hide behind anymore, right? It has to be very intentional, because uh, we all have unconscious biases. So again, speaking to I guess to the leadership, and it's interesting from the bottom up. I've heard certainly uh, we did a ULI, we did a, a diversity, equity, inclusion survey, and among our membership, and one of the outcomes that we learned is that um, some of the the younger you know um, uh, people getting into the industry realize that you know there's a lot of diversity at the junior levels, but but for some of the companies that they were in, it felt like ticking the box because once they got there, they didn't feel included. They didn't feel like, you know, like they belonged. So uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's great. Thank you. Norm, again, uh, you, you deal with a lot of different developers and individuals and leaders and clients. And uh, what have you seen? What have been your experiences? Yeah. Yeah. Like I, it's, it's evolving. Like, like Arlene said, I think it's, it's getting better. I think you'll see some organizations where, um, for whatever miraculous reason, you have diverse individuals that have reached the top, and those organizations are evolving faster and giving more chances to to people of um, minority minority groups. Um, but again, it's it comes down to, like Arlene said, unconscious bias, right? Like, I mean, we have a very strong stance here that your resume is really not that important because if we were to judge everyone on resumes currently marginalized groups would never get in the door. They would never get a single foot in the door. And we've had experiences where we've hired people whose resumes were utter garbage, but we interviewed them anyways, because there was just something that we liked about them and they've turned out to be stars. And so I think that's the thing is that, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And the first way to find out what you don't know is actually to bring it into your environment and bring it into your system and see how it performs. Cause it, just be prepared to be pleasantly surprised. Um, yeah, it's, it's crazy how um, people's unconscious biases, like I was sitting in a park the other day and I was sitting there, my daughter's playing and there was a group of teachers sitting next to me, they were teachers because they were talking about their teaching positions. And the, um, the subject of uh, in-school policing came in, right? They're talking, there's was, was three, three Caucasian people. And, and the one guy was like, I don't understand why there's such a big fuss about you know the police, and you know the the thing that he said that shocked me the most was he said, I don't believe that any of my black students are afraid of the police. I don't believe any of my black students have ever had a negative interaction with the police, and I think that's what bothers me the most about the the diversity inclusion equity um, conversation, is that people run on what they believe versus what is factual or what they know. You know what I mean? Like if, if he had an experience where, you know, he could see how the interactions happen, that'd be different. But all he's saying is, I believe. And, you know, but his beliefs come from his experiences as, you know, an older white male. And so I think that's, you know, th and that, that story just goes on and on and on in, in all kinds of environments where, it's your belief system needs to be challenged uh, and for the better, because I think, you know, a really smart person said to me once, you know, when you feel uncomfortable, run towards the discomfort because that's when you're going to grow. And I think a lot of people in, in a lot of different industries, not just real estate, need to feel some discomfort, not to be put in a position, position of discomfort, but to grow in a really, really positive way. Wow, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great, uh, great advice that when you feel uncomfortable, run towards that discomfort. I'm sure that's how you grow. Thank you, Norm. Uh, Brent, 
The real estate industry uh, cannot exist without banks. <laughs> banks are run by people, though, who ultimately decide who gets money and who doesn't. Uh, but if people only know what they know, how do we ensure that there is a truly level playing field where everyone is regarded and treated kind of, you know, uh, with equity? Uh, and what is, I guess, CIBC doing to embrace diversity, equity and inclusion in its operations? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an excellent, excellent question. And, you know, I, I thought I would share maybe some of the history uh, that banks have, have learned over, over the years of, of, of us doing this work. Um, as you, you likely know, banks are federally regulated uh, institutions. And so, you know, we've had to have equity uh, as part of our, our plans uh, since the mid 1980s. And, you know, I think the, the largest learn, learned learning um, that's come is the moment in time when people and, and companies realize that fixing the person is not the right way to go about this. What we really need to do is fix the workplace. Um, and I think as that started to fall away, and, and I can sure some of you are, are familiar with the very deeply uncomfortable seminars that were run uh, for women uh, in the 90s about how to shake hands like a man, uh, <laughs> or you know how to speak with authority, you know, so you could get that promotion, um, you know, and, and it really just shows that true kind of tone deaf nature to what was the actual problems that was was happening in, in the workplace at the time. And, you know, I think a lot of people spent a lot of time and energy trying to fix uh, a problem when really they were, they were try going about it totally the wrong way. Um, and so I, I think that you know, it, it comes back to inclusive leadership. And I, I really liked what, what Norm said earlier. And, you know, inclusive leadership is a, you know, maybe something, it's a bit of a hard to pin down topic for many, uh, but I think there's really only one way to define inclusive leadership and that's listening, right? If you're a good listener and you're able to ask questions and not, um, you know, kind of project your own beliefs into the world, that's a really good first step. Um, I think it also, requires us understanding that in the workplace, you know, certain, um, certain people from certain backgrounds experience headwinds, others experience tailwinds. And, you know, it isn't about the fact um, that, you know, you, you're um, having to work harder or, or less hard. It's recognizing, um, you know, that who you are can determine um, some of some of what you experience, right? So, you know, in many cases, the color of your skin or your gender or your gender identity, et cetera, can truly influence um, those factors. And, and workplaces like uh, banks, and I'm very proud that, that CIBC has, has really made inclusive leadership the core of our strategy, have really sought to help leaders to understand that, right? And through that work, better understand how we cre can create a workplace that does work for everyone. And, you know, starting to see the, the green shoots there, right, of, of us, you know, being um, more reflective of the clients and communities that we serve, both in, our, in terms of our broader population, but also our leadership uh, tables. And, you know, I think the way that we, I like to summarize that at least is, is saying that we have to practice intentional inclusion. And Arlene, I think you mentioned it earlier, right? That word intention. And you know, that's really what um, we have to, to bring uh, to this conversation. And you know, I often share the, you know, I'll share one final story, right? I think many people still think about you know, inclusion like uh, you, know, you come into the office at eight o'clock, you work through till, till 5.30 or six, and then from six till 6.30, you're like, okay, how am I gonna promote inclusion today? Um, and if that's your strategy, you waited too long. Um, you missed out on a number of opportunities that would have happened throughout the day. So I think that's the kind of lessons learned uh, from, from banking. And, and I think that the, you know, kind of real estate and construction industries, there's a question there, right, about, you know, what, what is the culture, right? What does the environment look like? And who does that environment work for? And who does it not work for? Um, and how much of that is influencing some of those really shocking statistics that Arlene shared earlier. Um, I think that, you know, it's not that women don't want to enter um, the construction industry or not that people of color aren't doing well in the real estate industry. It's that I don't think we've inspected our, our what does our workplace look like? How does it work? And what are some of the barriers there that we can start removing so that it truly does work for everyone? Thank you, Brent. Thank you for sharing. Uh some of the, uh, I guess, uh, experiences and uh, learnings from, I guess, the journey that uh, you're, that you're 
we're going through with uh, CIBC. So let's uh, switch gears now to a bit. Let's pivot a bit. And I'd like to ask each of you to share some of uh, your thoughts on your personal journeys so far. I'm sure many people in the audience are wondering, you know, how did you get to where you are today? Uh, was it deliberately thought out plan from high school? Did you figure it out as you went along? Or did someone encourage or inspire you to follow your path? And also, was it smooth sailing? Uh, did you, you know, encounter challenges or difficulties? And if so, how did you uh, overcome them? So uh, if I could ask each of you to share uh, some personal thoughts, that would be great. Arlene, can we start with you? Uh, yes, but, you know, Norm's story just triggered uh, a memory for me of the first time I was pulled over by the police. I was riding my bicycle. I was at university and... Um, who pulls yeah. over someone on a bicycle? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And uh, I had my thesis in my bag. I was told to put my hands up on a pole. Uh, they dumped my thesis back those, you know, this is very early nineties. Um, and you know, you write your thesis for four months and it was blowing in the wind and I was crying. It was never explained to me why I was pulled over and it was never, um, you know, I was just shaken to the core. I rode my bike home. I went to Carlton in Ottawa and, um, uh, and uh, I lived in Byward Market downtown about 20 minutes away and I, I cried all the way home. And who am I gonna tell my story to? And who's gonna believe that the policeman pulled me over? Um, anyways, so uh, to answer your question, sorry, you just triggered, it was like a flashback. Don't tell me about the police and I'm a woman. So never mind. I won't talk about my brothers or my husband or my nephews. And so um, I think uh, like uh, many um, uh, people, you know, my family came to Canada when uh, Canada changed its immigration policy and started letting in uh, black families in the early sixties. Um, and I grew up in Bloor West um, uh, village and, and um I was the only one. I, I, I often tell the story of having a fight with my mother because she wouldn't let me go to Polish class and she finally put her foot down because she told me it would be of no benefit because I wasn't Polish. Um, and so I moved on to Maltese class. So, you know, that's, uh, that's what I knew uh, coming from Trinidad and moving to Canada when I was four. And then going through the school system, my mother was a school teacher and that's the only thing that saved me because my teachers tried to stream me into, back then they you know, used to get streamed to grade 12 or grade 13 and they thought I wasn't bright enough to go on to university. So they would stream you from grade nine, uh, which my mother refused to allow happen. But um, in high school, I was always the only one, just like elementary school. Um, and uh, I was uh, isolated. So yeah, I was disengaged and, and disenfranchised and, you know, my childhood dreams of becoming an architect kind of fell away. Um, and I worked out a crazy deal with my mom to, uh, if I took a gap year, I'd have to fill out my university applications. And while I was traveling through Europe, you know, pursuing my dance career, uh, my mother submitted my applications and I got accepted to multiple schools, but to punish her, I decided to go to the one furthest away from her. So I went to Carleton, um, where mm -hmm. by the time I was in third year, I was um, um, a teaching assistant and an assistant professor by the time I um, graduated uh, living in Rome. So that's, uh, that's to say it's perseverance of a mother who knows her child as opposed to a child that believes society. Um, and in terms of my career, I think that uh, I've surrounded myself with really amazing people. So I think 80% of my life would be luck. Um, my parents would argue that I'm brilliant, but you know, they love me. And um, I had really good promoters and champions and allies, but my most influential first mentor I had to check my own bias because he was a very old, wealthy, white developer from Virginia. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time um, of one of the biggest real estate organizations in the U.S. And um, he knew he had privilege, but he also understood he had a responsibility to do something with it. And he constantly challenged me to be better, 
to speak up, to teach me how to invest, um, to do things with my finances, to buy my first home. And I, and I hope and pray that other people that are listening to this reach out to people within their community and step up, even if they seem to resist you, because you know, an old rich white developer from Virginia is scary to a young black woman. Um, and I was wrong and I have to check my own biases, right? And really, um, really uh, embrace becoming who I hoped I could be, but he enabled me to truly authentically be myself. So that's a little bit about my story. Wow. Yeah. Uh, importance and the impact of, of mentors, right? Or whether they're invited or not. And, uh, thank you, Arlene, for sharing sharing your stories. Andrew, do you want to share some thoughts on your journey? Um, yeah, that's, it's amazing um, to hear his background. Uh, and, and Norm, uh, of the panel, two people have been pulled over on the bike by police. I have as well. I've been pulled over three times. In I grew up in Etobicoke, um, two in car, but once on my bike. Uh, but it's just, I think, as you said, some people have a perspective and they don't think it happens in certain areas, but it does. Um, and, but I've had, you know, good act interactions with police as well. And so uh, I have to balance that, but I, I know statistically it doesn't make sense, those kind of uh, experiences. Uh, I, I know you gave us a, a, a kind of a snapshot from high school on, so I guess I'll give you a few snapshots. I think in, in high school, I felt uh, I went to a very um, culturally diverse uh, high school, um, pretty, I think even socioeconomically diverse. So it was kind of, uh, I, I enjoyed my high school experience. I would say I wasn't, I had a, a keen interest on business. No one in my family worked in business, but I was attracted to case studies and problem solving from that perspective. Um, I know I, I had a junior achievement kind of was one of those things that kind of opened my eyes to, to, to business. I know they still exist. Um, and so certain programs kind of created exposure where I might not have had that um, internally, but I, I did remember there was a this kind of a cliff kind of going to university because it went from this huge diverse area to where, um, you know, a, a lot of my other racialized um, colleagues never didn't end up there. And I was like, well, they're just as smart as I am. And, you know, it's, it's not like um, we all had money to go and before I wanted to go to university from day, from day one. Um, but, you know, I think you could start to see systemically how there was such a huge cutoff once I got to kind of post-secondary. Um, I think one of the things that helped me in university was a co-op program. Uh, again, as much as I, I learned in class and, and thank you for that, I think uh, kind of the school of hard knocks of, of working in co-op and working a year and working in the hospitality industry for over a year. Uh, and, and that was one of the things I think that was a deciding factor in me looking at real estate. I think I was uh, interested in finance, but I'd see people come and go from the hotel uh, from all works of life with judges, lawyers, diplomats, um, stockbrokers, and so on, but uh, really had affinity for the real estate developers. I thought, you know, these people think long term, their impact was really vis vis um, visible. Uh, so, so kind of that put me on that path, but again, not much access to developers. There wasn't anyone I would say in my family or my professional network that I could reach out to say, you know, well, how do you get into this business? Um, uh, and then I'd kind of fast forward, look, I would manage to get a role as a, as an appraiser and valuer of real estate. And I think that was, um, pretty pivotal in, in terms of me getting exposure to developers and. Uh, I covered Ontario, Quebec, and the Maritimes, and met dozens of developers trying to get projects off the ground uh, in Canada. And so I think that uh, was really pivotal in terms of trying to get there. But there was no, there was no master plan for sure, um, but I did have to scrape for opportunities. And, uh, and when I got them, I tried to make the most of them. And I think part of the challenge was still, even when I saw this, a, it was good to, to see all these developers, but seeing so few were um, look like me, I still felt at that point that, you know, there'd be no path for me in this field. So 
um, I would say after that experience, as much as it turned me on to the sector, I was pretty gung-ho about moving to the States because I figured you know, that would be the only opportunity for a minority in the development world. I just didn't see it here. And, and um, luckily, uh, you know, with the help of some associations and some um, opportunities that came up in, in Canada, uh, came up as I was, uh, before I made the, the, the decision to kind of do my MBA in the States and, and to the U.S. and so I'm, I'm grateful that some opportunities opened up here, and you know, hopefully, um, as, as more people see opportunities, see people that look like themselves in the executive positions here, uh, they have the, the, the faith that there are opportunities as well. Thank you, Andrew. I grew, I, I grew up uh, in Etobicoke as well, so I went to I went to Thistletown Collegiate. I don't know where you went. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting, your perception. I mean, when my, my high school is very ethnically diverse, but it's true. Once you hit university, it's like a completely different world. Uh, you didn't see, that, didn't see that same diversity, certainly. So I uh, thank you for sharing your stories. And I'm glad you stayed in Canada and didn't go to the U.S. Uh, Brent, did you want to share some thoughts on your journey? Absolutely. Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously my, my journey is a little, a little different. Um, you know, it's always important to start by recognizing that I am a, a cisgendered white man. And you know that doesn't mean that my life hasn't been hard, um, but it means that the color of my skin and my gender haven't made it harder. Um, I will share that um, my sexual orientation, uh, being uh, part of the LGBTQ plus community has certainly had some uh, challenges. And uh, I'll also share that I too grew up in Etobicoke. So it's a bit of a trifecta. And um, you know, I think uh, the 90s, unfortunately, was a slightly very, very different place than, than we are today. I think we've come leaps and bounds uh, in terms of inclusion uh, for the LGBT community uh, here in Canada and, and around the world. And, and part of that experience led me um, to, to do some work right out of university in the public policy and human rights space, uh, specifically supporting uh, LGBT, the LGBT community in the UK. And you know, I, I actually stumbled upon the workplace as, a, as an area of focus and um, you know, it wasn't my intention, it wasn't my purpose at the time, um, but I, I quickly learned that, you know, the workplace plays such a huge part of our, our lives, right? Our careers, they give us purpose. Um, they give us income, right? They make, give us connections. They give us the ability to travel the world. And so, you know, I think discrimination and a lack of opportunity in the workplace is, is such an important area for us to focus on. Um, and that kind of became my, my life purpose. And it's obviously led me to, to a career uh, in the HR uh, space. And um, I think, you know, what I'll also share there is that, you know, although we do often think about, you know, inclusion being formally tagged to HR and, you know, people like myself are, are privileged to be able to do this work full time, we're all, we all have the ability to be champions, right? And I think you've heard stories of people on the call uh, on the panelists today, and they certainly are champions and have benefited from other champions, but all people on this call have the opportunity to lean into this work. And in fact, it is the responsibility of all of us uh, to lean into this conversation and find those mentors, um, become sponsors, um, think about the ways in which things aren't working today and, and try to change them. Because I, I think uh, in the words of, of our, our CEO and president, Victor Dodig, you know, this, this work isn't a sociological experiment, is a business imperative, right? We will only grow as a, as a country, as an economy, if we get this right. And, and truly, at, we have a bit of a once in a lifetime opportunity right now, uh, as we recover from the, the pandemic, to not just kind of build back to what we had, but actually build back to what we could have had. And so I definitely invite everybody on the phone, even if you don't have uh, a, a designation or an HR um, bone in your body, you are a leader and you have the opportunity to make a real difference. Thank you, Brent. And uh, yeah, what a coincidence, we have three Topico <laughs> it's here. Um, Norm, can we uh, get some thoughts from you on your journey so far? Um, I think uh, my journey has been one of uh, defying convention. <laughs> um, uh, uh, growing up in high school, I was always, you know, sort of the odd guy out. And even before that, and so um, I've always known to be, you know, 
you, you have to speak up to get noticed or, or to get ahead. And so I, I practice that on a daily basis. I think uh, anyone in the audience who knows me knows I'm, I'm not prone to ho hold my tongue. And uh, so as I, as I progress through the industry, I think that's what sort of allowed me to sort of make my mark or, or get ahead is that, you know, I will, I will uh, make bold or provocative statements just to get my foot in the door. And I think that's, that's served me quite well. So I'll encourage anyone that's sort of out there trying to get ahead, you know, don't, don't shy away from speaking your mind and, and, you know, saying what you really think, because, you know, that's what, you know, everyone's got good ideas, right? And your ideas are just as good as anyone else's. And, and I think that's what people are looking for. And, and that's what will get you uh, through the door. Um, I just think that, you know, just to touch on what uh, Brent just said, I think, you know, the one thing that in terms of a business perspective is that, you know, diversity, inclusion, and equity is, it's good for business, period. I think that's what most leaders need to understand and recognize. And with the demographics going the way they are, it's going to come for you sooner or later. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Well, kind of, right? Like, I mean, if you're an all white organization of stodgy old white guys who don't understand equity and, and I, I don't mean to shade all white guys like that, and, but there's, you know, there's, there's a type, right? Like, I mean, I've had enough interactions on social media to, to run into them. Um, diversity, equity, inclusion is not about taking away from those who have privilege. It's about providing net new privilege to those that don't currently have it. And with the way the demographics are going, your audiences, your buyers, your clients, all these people, like there's a lot of young people like myself and, and I'm very, very lucky I've come up and, and I've done well and I run an organization. And now I have people coming to me looking for my business and I'm still gonna go out and, and look for the best, um, best fit for a supplier. But I mean, the problem with this diversity conversation is that the bias runs both ways, right? So like, if we're not all gonna be nice about being embracing of each other, it just runs to this point where like, you know, then another segment of the population gets shut out. And I think you're starting to see that where, you know, the sort of white male population that gets really upset about this kind of stuff, they're starting to feel that, that tension and that being shut out. And I think, you know, the, the sooner we can all get to that place where inclusion, equity, and, and diversity is a thing, a real thing, not just, you know, ticking the boxes or, or IG posts, I think we'll move forward as a country, as an economy, and as a society. And, and I think, you know, I would encourage everyone to sort of be more vocal about you know, staking their, their positions and sort of moving ahead so that we can all have a place at the table and, and have all our voices heard and, and have that cohesion as, as a city, a, a province, as, and as a nation. Thank you, Norm. I know we're running a bit over on time and uh, wow, I've taken a lot of great notes. And I just want to end with kind of a, our final question here to the panel before we go, before we run out of time. Um, I know all of you have kind of touched on, uh, on kind of next steps and what can we do moving forward. But if you can kind of leave our audience today with kind of one call to action or challenge on you know, what all each of us can do starting now as individuals, as managers, as employers, uh, to, to become, to be these change makers, uh, what, what, what message would you leave? So Brent, we'll start with you. Sure, thanks. Um, so I would say, stop making excuses. Um, this is, as Norm said, you know, it, it's now, it's a demographic reality that we're living in. Um, you know, if you're thinking about your, you know, own succession or your next hire, don't wait um, for that decision to come um, because if you wait, it may likely be too late. So write down on a little napkin or whatever you have in front of you, who is in your network, who you think is really fantastic. Um, you know, people who you're sponsoring, uh, people who you're investing your time in. And if those people all look and have similar experiences to yourself, you got to do better um, and you got to start now, right? You've got to start with that proactive leaning in so that when the time comes and you do have that opportunity to give someone an op give someone a, a new role or, or uh, provide someone a, a great career opportunity, you're going to be able to choose from a wider range of talent that reflects this amazing um, and diverse 
uh, economy that we have today. And uh, I think that likely is uh, the big change that happened last year, right? You know, the time for excuses, you know, the talent's just not out there. I tried, I looked, but I couldn't find it. You know, I think most of us uh, are in client focused businesses that if you said that to your boss about why you couldn't bring in the new client, it's not going to fly. Uh, and I think for this, it's got to be exactly the same way. Andrew, what's your parting message to everyone? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, there's some, some, some good things. One of the things is a, that idea of walking in someone else's shoes, I think is quite important. Um, I think there's a lot of ally events that are um, opening up for, for the real estate sector. And, um, you know, myself, as I, I've been involved in a lot of racialized community organizations, but I've recently um, joined crew and, and women in capital markets. And, and just, again, I think personally putting myself in an area where, you know, I can start to challenge my own biases and assumptions. And, um, and, and I think that's one thing personally people can do is that you don't have to be in HR. Um, I think you know, another part that's really important for us is just that inclusive um, design. Don't always, especially in a residential builder type of world, don't always start imagining this nuclear family. Um, study the demographics. Uh, I, I think they're, they're turning away a lot of opportunities in businesses. Um, because we're not assuming multi-generational homes, uh, not assuming a sharing economy. Uh, we're marketing, you know, say, hey, there's a grocery store nearby, but not you know, ignoring nearby small businesses or cultural opportunities. So I think just having, you gotta, you gotta start with, with a different, from a different starting point um, when you're designing, conceptualizing development. Um, and so those are a couple of ideas that I have. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Norm, what's your uh, takeaway or challenge to our audience? Uh, I challenge everyone to uh, hire someone they wouldn't normally hire. And once you do hire that person, give them space and grace. I think, you know, especially in a time like this where, you know, COVID is very, very, very challenging. And like, we're already seeing it, you know, talent is very tight out there. So where are you going to find talent anyways? So, I mean, you might as well give someone a chance. And when you do give them a chance, don't rush them to success or failure, you know, set them, set them up for success and give them chances along the way. Because like, like myself, I am the recipient of multiple, multiple chances in life. And, you know, without those second chances, I wouldn't be where I am today. And, you know, I just, I, you know, we, we always actively look to give people those chances. We, we, we have recently and we continue to do so. Um, and yeah, like, I mean, look, if the country is gonna welcome 400,000 immigrants a year in an effort to bolster our economy, let's give them a chance to work in the workforce as well. Not just to, you know, pay rent on a condo, to buy groceries, consumer goods and all this shit, right? Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna have us come, you know, puff up the economy, you know, they should get a piece as well. So yeah, that's, that's the one takeaway I think people should, should, should uh, have there. Amazing. Thank you, Norm. And Arlene, what's your takeaway for our audience? Uh, so I have three and they're really quick and I always do these three. So to all the young people in the audience, uh, dance with your fear. Don't take no, just ask why not. To all of us that are just in business, I say challenge with empathy. Um, if you start there, you'll come out with a better outcome. And uh, to everyone, I would say, reach one and teach one. And it's in all of us to be the champion, the mentor, the ally, um, at the role model. Uh, you'll find your place, um, but it's your responsibility. All of us here have privilege in that we've reached where we have. And if you have the opportunity to participate in this, then you can reach one and teach one. Thanks. Wow. Oh my goodness. I know we're at 12. Uh, we didn't quite have the time for questions. Uh, it's just a, a wonderful discussion. We do have one though that I want to squeeze in if that's okay with everyone. Uh, we have a question. What do you think is the most challenging aspect of working in a diverse working environment? And I believe Norm, you, Norm you'd like to uh, share your well, thoughts I, I, on that? I, I think the, the question of a di diverse working environment, whether it's 
diverse, look, every env working environment is diverse, period. And I've found that in my experience, the number one thing that makes it go better is if everyone can check their egos at the door. And again, just that idea of space and grace, right? Is that like, just, you, you can't hold so hard on your own position that you, you write off everyone else's position because that just leads to conflict. You, you, just, you have to make time for other people's positions. And, and that's, I don't care if it's a diverse workspace or not, like just working with people in general, as a general rule, space and grace. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I know we've come to the end here. And wow, it's been, I don't know how you feel, but it's been very invigorating and inspiring. Uh, you know, bias runs both ways. Diversity, equity, and inclusion is not taking away its new opportunities. Uh, inclusive leadership is important. Uh, intentional inclusion is important. And we all can have a responsibility and a role to play, no matter who we are. Uh, to, to lean in and to help make this change happen in our own little world. And yeah, and it makes business sense. Not that we're only doing this because it makes business sense, but think of all that untapped potential, right? The 400,000 immigrants coming uh, in every year. Thank you, Norm. It's so true, right? We're not just bringing them in here to spend their money. Uh, you know, what is that untapped potential we have in our country, uh, our region, our city? Uh, and if we can unleash that, uh, wow. So um, Thank you, panelists, for an amazing discussion. We probably could have gone on forever. And I hope the audience, I hope you've enjoyed this as well. Uh, I'm going to now uh, turn it over to uh, Chris for a, a wrap up. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Jeannie. Norm, space and grace, thank you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone on today's panel for such a candid and important conversation. Um, now I'd like to speak to everyone directly in our, in our audience. Thank you for being here. You are our allies. Go out, affect change in areas where you have influence. Like Arlene said, we need to be intentional in changing our industry. So run toward the discomfort, be vocal, challenge with empathy, and become change makers. PMA is pleased to make a contribution to the Black Opportunity Fund to help further their mission to combat the impact of anti-Black racism in Canada. Please visit www.blackopportunityfund.ca for more information. If you'd like to get access to more EDI resources and information specific to real estate and development, please visit ULI Toronto at toronto.uli.org and also buildgta.ca. And now it's time for our draw courtesy of CIBC. And our first winner today is Katrina Cross. Katrina, congratulations. You'll get an email from uh, CIBC with your lunch uh, gift certificate. And our second winner today is Gary McIlvery from Empire Communities. Congratulations, Gary. I'd like to thank all of our sponsors. First, CIBC, our title sponsor and industry partner, SR Law, Balcony Bliss, my Design Studio, Sagan, Smart Touch, Next Home, Buzz Buzz Home, Build, Orea, Reliance, and Westmount Project. A special thank you to our event producer, McEwitt Partnership. Now please join us for our next session on May 27th at 11 a.m. where we will feature a panel from Metrolinks discussing transit, development, and the future of the GTA. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great rest of the day.